Welcome. In today's message, the Apostle Paul has finally arrived at Rome. He's been there for about three days, and now he calls upon the uh, elders and the leaders of the Jews in the synagogues of Rome to come and meet with him. He's going to explain to them why he is there in chains for the hope of Israel. Hello, I'm Dr. James Jones, the pastor of the DeRitter Presbyterian Church in DeRitter, Louisiana, and the First Reformed Presbyterian Church Mission of Moss Bluff, Louisiana. I'm glad that you're worshiping with us today. Let us pray. Almighty and eternal God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, as we read the concluding verses of the book of Acts today, we ask that the Holy Spirit who inspired your servant Luke to write this account of the Apostle Paul's life uh, to give us wisdom and understanding and grace and to see how though Paul himself was chained, the gospel itself is never chained. We pray that you would grant us uh, this grace and this wisdom in Christ that we might love and serve you through him all the days of our lives. Please cleanse us of our sin and of all unrighteousness for we plead the blood and the righteousness of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Hear now the Word of God from the final chapter of Acts, Acts chapter 28. We are going to begin our reading at verse 17 and read to the end of the book, which is verse 31. After three days, Paul called together those who were the leading men of the Jews, and when they had come together, he began saying to them, Brethren, though I had done nothing against our people or the customs of our fathers, yet I was delivered as a prisoner from Jerusalem into the hands of the Romans. And when they had examined me, they were willing to release me because there was no ground for putting me to death. But when the Jews objected, I was forced to appeal to Caesar, not that I had any accusation against my nation. For this reason, therefore, I requested to see you and to speak with you, for I am wearing this chain for the sake of the hope of Israel. They said to him, We have neither received letters from Judea concerning you, nor have any of the brethren come here and reported or spoken anything bad about you. But we desire to hear from you what your views are. For concerning this sect, it is known to us that it is spoken against everywhere. When they had set a day for Paul, they came to him at his lodging in large numbers. And he was explaining to them by solemnly testifying about the kingdom of God and trying to persuade them concerning Jesus from both the law of Moses and from the prophets from morning until evening. Some were being persuaded by the things spoken, but others would not believe. And when they did not agree with one another, they began leaving after Paul had spoken one parting word. The Holy Spirit rightly spoke through Isaiah the prophet to your fathers, saying, Go to this people and say, You will keep on hearing, but will not understand, and you will keep on seeing, but will not perceive. For the heart of this people has become dull, and with their ears they scarcely hear, and they have closed their eyes. Otherwise they might see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and return, and I would heal them. Therefore, let it be known to you that this salvation of God has been sent to the Gentiles. They will also listen. When he had spoken these words, the Jews departed, having great dispute among themselves. And he stayed two full years in his own rented quarters and was welcoming all who came to him, preaching the kingdom of God and teaching concerning the Lord Jesus Christ with all openness, unhindered. Amen. This is God's holy, inspired, inerrant, and infallible word. May he add his rich blessings to our reading, hearing, and understanding of it this day. The Apostle Paul has finally arrived at Rome after a very arduous journey, shipwreck, uh, some time spent on the island of Malta in which he was bitten by a snake. And he has uh, finally arrived. He is still a prisoner of Rome. He is under house arrest, essentially, there uh, in the uh, capital of the empire. And Paul is hindered, and yet 
uh, is the gospel hindered? Is his ministry at an end? I don't think so. We'll see what happens as Paul begins to uh, preach to the Jewish leaders in the uh, capital city of Rome. Uh, Paul is there. He's allowed this place with only one guard. And uh, at this residence where he is, and we're not sure if this, uh, where he first is at the beginning of this section, is the same place he is at the very end of the chapter, or whether he's moved to a, a different residence. He's either in a cell or he's in a private apartments of some kind that he's rented, or rooms of uh, some sort. But he calls for the leaders of Rome to come to him. And the reason he does this is because uh, normally he would be the one who, when he arrives in a new town or a new city, uh, would go immediately to the synagogues to uh, preach the gospel to the Jews who were found there. But because Paul is a prisoner with a Roman guard, he can't travel. And so he requests that the leaders of the synagogues come to him. And they do. They do uh, displace themselves. They come to him. They want to hear what he's got to say. Now, there were probably very many synagogues in Rome at that particular time. The estimates of the number of Jews in the capital of the Roman uh, Empire uh, at the time in which uh, Paul was a prisoner there was somewhere between 20,000 people and 50,000 people. So it was a large Jewish population in the capital. Paul has called for the leaders, and that means the uh, elders, the leaders of the synagogues, uh, various numbers of synagogues there in the city. And they all come. And he wants to speak to them because this is his, his principle that he's followed all along. Whenever he goes uh, to a new place, he preaches first in the synagogue, uh, tries to persuade the Jews of the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. If and when, in every single case, he is rejected, he then turns uh, to the Gentiles to preach. And so he's following exactly that pattern in Rome as well. Uh, when they have assembled together in his place, he begins to explain to them how he is there and why he is there, why he is there as a prisoner in chains. Uh, this defense that he gives at the beginning of this section here in verse 17 is very similar to the defense that we saw, we read recently, uh, that he gave before uh, King Herod Agrippa II at Caesarea. It's a recapitulation of the same arguments, the same things. And so Paul declares to the leaders of the Jews there in Rome, uh, first of all, his innocence. Uh, he says, uh, as he has always said, I have done nothing against the Jewish people. I have done nothing against the customs that have been handed down by the patriarchs. Uh, that was a charge that was leveled against him by the Jews in Jerusalem, and he denied that, and he uh, continues to deny that. I haven't done anything against them. Uh, he basically says, I, I was arrested falsely. And so he talks about his false arrest, that he was in Jerusalem, uh, Luke does not go into the details of his being at the temple and uh, being thought uh, trying to uh, desecrate the temple by bringing a Gentile into the courts or anything like that. But he uh, simply says that he was in Jerusalem, he was arrested, and he was handed over to the Romans and was tried by them. He was examined by the authorities and uh, that uh, there were grounds for his acquittal. And so he mentions how the Roman authorities had examined him, and yet he says they uh, basically testified that nothing was found against him that was worthy of the death penalty. Uh, and therefore the Roman officials were willing and uh, eager to let him go. Uh, first uh, 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 Felix, and then uh, Festus, and, and even Herod Agrippa all uh, confessed that there was nothing worthy of imprisonment or of death on the part of the Apostle Paul. However, he continued to have legal problems, he tells the Jews. And the legal problems basically were that the Jews in Jerusalem did not want him to go free. Uh, they still had it in for him. Uh, they uh, lobbied the Roman officials to keep Paul in prison. And in order to keep the peace, the Roman officials did do just that. They kept hold of Paul, even though they knew that he was innocent of the charges. And therefore, uh, Paul saw no other alternative than to appeal to Caesar, which was his right as a Roman citizen. And so he did do that. And so he explains to the Jews in Rome, this is how I ended up here. Uh, I did all of these things. I was forced to appeal to Caesar because of this. But he says to them very quickly, I am not going to be bringing counter charges. He's not going to bring a counter lawsuit against the Jews for false arrest or false imprisonment. He's not going to do that at all. 
Uh, he, he knows that they've been persecuting him, but he's going to let that slide altogether. So there's not a countercharge of some time, uh, kind, although Paul would have had grounds to do so if he'd wanted to. His desire is simply to set the record straight with the leaders of the Jews there at Rome. And he says to them uh, in a shorthand way, we've seen him use this same terminology, I am a prisoner in chains, he says here, for the sake of the hope of Israel. Now, Paul has mentioned that over and over again in his defense. And we saw, of course, that what he's talking about when he talks about the hope of Israel is the hope of the resurrection to come and the fact that that resurrection to come is all tied up in the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ from the dead as the Messiah and as the Savior of sinners. Now, the Jews respond to what Paul has said here uh, by saying that they had not received any type of communication. They were unaware entirely of Paul's situation. They've come to find out exactly what is going on. Uh, they haven't received any letters from Jerusalem, and that may be because uh, there had not yet been enough time for sea travel to resume, for the postal service to pick back up again after the winter for a letter to arrive if it was coming, but there's no indication that one ever did come. Uh, it's possible that the Jewish authorities in Jerusalem thought that Rome had now had charge of Paul and that Rome would now take care of him, and so they didn't send any official communication at all to the synagogues in Rome. Or it could be that no one had been sent from Jerusalem to Rome because uh, they didn't see any need to continue to pursue Paul. Uh, he had already been declared to be not guilty by two Roman governors and by Herod Agrippa II himself. And also, it was very, very expensive to hire a lawyer, especially in the capital of Rome. I'm sure that uh, those lawyers were more high-priced than they would have been out in the uh, sticks uh, like Caesarea somewhere. Uh, and so they simply didn't want to spend the money. It was too far away to try to prosecute this thing. And so they just let Paul go and left him to whatever Rome was going to decide. However, these Jews in Rome do say to Paul, we have heard of this sect that you are talking about. As a matter of fact, everybody throughout the whole world speaks against it. Now we're talking about Christianity. We're talking about uh, what, is, uh, what they called the sect of the Nazarene, uh, which was uh, of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. And uh, the fact that there were many Jews in many synagogues who took great offense at the teaching and preaching that Jesus is the Messiah, that He is the one prophesied, He is the one who has come, He is the one who has fulfilled Old Testament Scripture promises and prophecies. And so uh, they did. There were many enemies who uh, got all up in arms and, and spoke against the teaching of Christ. And so they said, we've heard that. And they, they presented in one of the worst cases possible, everybody speaks against Christianity. However, they say, uh, we do want to hear your views. And so uh, they, they are impressed, I think, by the fact that the Apostle Paul, once again, in his demeanor, has not uh, blasted them. He has not called them names. He has not cursed Israel. He has not done any of these types of things. He hasn't shown great anger. Uh, and he instead is a very deliberate uh, a, a very temperate, a very respectful, and a very articulate spokesman for Christ. And they are willing to hear what his views happen to be. And so uh, they set a time and a place, same place, obviously, Paul's imprisonment. And uh, they will gather even other leaders there, and they will all come to hear what Paul has to say in his defense. And so at the appointed time, on the appointed day, uh, these leaders and others gather together with the Apostle Paul to hear what he has to say. And Paul holds forth uh, for a long time. Uh, Luke tells us he started in the morning and he goes all the way to the evening and he is explaining to the Jews his beliefs about the Lord Jesus Christ and about the kingdom of God. And so uh, there are all types of things that Paul is engaged in doing here as he seeks to persuade his audience of the truths of the claims of Jesus Christ. And so his methods are spelled out uh, when Luke uses three different types of terms to describe his preaching and teaching to this uh, gathering that's there. 
He was explaining or expounding to them the truth. And so uh, that's a, a term that has to do with using various explanations, using uh, lots of different types of information to show to them uh, the truths that he was uh, speaking of. And of course, the truth that he's centrally focused on is that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is indeed the Messiah spoken of in the Old Testament scriptures, that he has come. He has fulfilled the promises uh, they did to him exactly as it was predicted in Scripture. He was crucified, died, buried, and rose again on the third day. And he is now the Savior, not only of Jews, but of Gentiles who believe. Uh, he did uh, this by explaining and expounding. The second uh, method that he used was solemnly testifying. And that's a term that speaks of personal experience. And so Paul probably, once again, was relating his experience on the road to Damascus, how he had an encounter with the risen Lord Jesus Christ, how Christ spoke to him, gave him his commission uh, to take the gospel uh, far away to the Gentiles and so on. And so he was explaining all of these things and he gives his personal experience of his relationship to Christ, how Christ had uh, brought him alive from the dead spiritually, had given him eyes to see and ears to hear and a heart to believe and to uh, understand and, and through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ to obey the gospel. Uh, he does that. And altogether what he's trying to do, Luke says, is to persuade them. That means to change their minds. Uh, Paul has great rhetorical skills. He has uh, many powers uh, to be able to gather together evidence and uh, all of these uh, truths in a convicting and convincing fashion. And he presents to them this heartfelt uh, appeal to turn to Christ in repentance and faith. And so uh, that word persuasion carries with it uh, the idea of a great amount of energy and a great amount of emotional conviction. This is uh, the central truth that governs Paul's life. And he wants his audience to understand and to hear that and themselves to commit themselves to the Lord Jesus Christ by repenting of their sins and by trusting in Christ for salvation. And his message is spelled out here. It's a twofold message that he preached everywhere he went. The message was about the kingdom of God and the message was about the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, the kingdom of God, he's preaching, and, and we're, we're also told he did this from the scriptures of the Old Testament, from the law of Moses and from the prophets. So uh, he is proclaiming the kingdom of God from the Old Testament. Now, that shouldn't surprise us as Christians because the New Testament is full of the term kingdom of God. Uh, John the Baptist came preaching the kingdom. Uh, Jesus came preaching the kingdom. And yet in the Old Testament, we don't find the phrase kingdom of God used that very often. However, we do find uh, the, the fact that God is spoken of repeatedly as king. And so uh, the obvious implication is if God is king, he has a kingdom. And all of creation is his kingdom. And Israel is his kingdom. And he has a king to, see, uh, to be seated upon the throne. And he had given promises to King David that one of his seed would sit on his throne forever. And that promise is fulfilled in Christ. And so the Apostle Paul uh, in expressing the kingdom of God and expressing the rule and reign of God naturally comes to Jesus as the king upon the throne and he begins to preach to them Jesus Christ who is king of kings and lord of lords. Uh, he is speaking about the fact that Christ is the messianic king over the messianic kingdom that he is the fulfillment of all of those promises of the Old Testament and all of the prophecies of the Messiah to come. Now, the means that Paul used were the ordinary means of grace. Paul was an apostle, and he was able to use what is spoken of in the book of Acts as the signs of the apostle, which included miracles. Yet he does not do that here. Uh, he had been on the island of Malta. Uh, he had been bitten by a snake and was not killed. Uh, he had uh, healed the uh, uh, leading man of the island, Publius's father, who was uh, stricken with what was known as the Malta fever. Uh, he had healed him as well as healing other uh, Gentiles there on the island of Malta. But Paul does not do any of that here in the presence of these Jewish leaders. 
Instead, he resorts to what we resort to today, which is the written Word of God, the Scriptures uh, for him specifically. That was the Old Testament. That was the uh, part of the Bible that the Jews believed. And so he went to the Bible to show them that Christ is the promised Messiah. And so he spoke to them from the law of Moses, and he spoke to them from the prophets. He, he, there are so many references, it would be impossible to list all of them, but think about this just for a minute. If he spoke from the law of Moses, then he certainly spoke to them about the fact that Moses himself made the prediction that one would come who would be a uh, prophet like Moses, uh, that the people were supposed to heed and hear and listen to and follow. And we know that the one spoken of there is the Lord Jesus Christ. He is our great prophet. Well, we know that uh, from, the, uh, uh, from the prophets uh, that there were also uh, prophecies of the suffering servant in Isaiah, for example, or the one like the Son of Man in the book of Daniel, and all of these things are fulfilled in the life and ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so Paul certainly spoke of these things as well as many, many other things from the Old Testament Scriptures. Now, this provoked a typical response uh, from those who heard. Anytime Paul preached, there were at least two responses, yes and no. Uh, and that's exactly what we find here. Uh, some were persuaded by what Paul had to say. In other words, there were some of the Jewish leaders who understood what Paul was proclaiming from the Old Testament Scriptures. The Holy Spirit opened their eyes to see these things. He unstopped their ears to hear the truth. He gave them hearts to understand and to believe and, and to trust in what uh, was being proclaimed in the Gospel. And so these folks uh, were persuaded by the message of the Gospel that Jesus Christ is the Savior. He is the Messiah. He is the one to whom they must go. But there were others, obviously, who were not. Uh, they would not believe. Uh, Luke puts it that way. Others would not believe. Now, uh, they would not believe, and that speaks of the fact that there is hard-hearted, stubborn rebellion against the truth that has been proclaimed to them by the Apostle Paul. It is a deliberate steadfast, uh, selfish rejection of the gospel. Uh, and the reason that they would not believe, of course, Paul explains elsewhere, is that they could not believe. And the reason they could not believe is because these were spiritual truths and only those who uh, are indwelt by the Holy Spirit, only those upon whom the Holy Spirit is working are able to understand and to see and to hear spiritual truth. And so because these men uh, did not have the Holy Spirit, they could not understand what was being proclaimed by Paul, and yet they continued to persist in their uh, refusal. They would not understand. Uh, because of this. And so their blindness is a guilty blindness, their, their deafness is a guilty deafness, and their hard-heartedness, even though they are dead in trespasses and sins, is a guilty, culpable deadness in their hearts because of this steadfast refusal to hear the gospel message, to repent, and to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so uh, they began to depart, and, and uh, uh, Luke tells us that they were disputing with one another. So they, they divided into warring factions, practically, and they're arguing with one another as they depart. But uh, Paul has a last word for all of them as they are leaving. That last word is not something that Paul made up on the spot. He quotes from Isaiah the prophet, from Isaiah chapter 6 in particular. He's quoting from the call that was given to Isaiah uh, by the Lord when uh, Isaiah was at the temple, uh, and there he saw a vision of actually Jesus seated upon the throne. Uh, he fell down uh, before the Lord, uh, recognizing his own sinfulness, and his, his sins were cleansed, and he was sent forth on his mission and yet his mission was not one that uh, many people would want exactly because of what's said here. And so he was to go and he was to proclaim uh, to Israel uh, a truth that they did not want to hear. 
uh, he was preaching to them. And uh, these words had to do with the fact that uh, as he proclaimed the truth, Isaiah, Isaiah proclaimed the truth to them, and as Paul proclaimed the truth to these uh, Jewish leaders, they left him less able and less sensitive to the truth than they were when they first came. And that was because of the hardening and deadening effect of the curse that fell upon them because of their unbelief. And so, uh, from Isaiah, uh, God had told uh, him to go to the people and say to them, you will keep on hearing, but you will not understand. Uh, that's a, a very difficult thing. Think about it for just a minute. I have a, a, a lot of deafness in my right ear. And so, uh, if someone comes up to me on the right side and speaks to me, I can hear words but I cannot understand. I know that they're talking. I know that words are being said, but there's no comprehension of what is being said. I can't use a phone on the right side either because I can only get parts of the conversation. And so it's, it, that's spiritually what he's talking about here, uh, that uh, Isaiah is proclaiming clearly the truth that they are, the people are to repent and return to the Lord, that Paul is proclaiming the truth that men are to repent of their sins and turn to the Lord Jesus Christ, and yet uh, the words are all garbled because of their sin. They do not understand, and the longer it goes, the more garbled the message is in their own minds because of the curse that's falling upon them. Uh, instead of seeing, he says, uh, you will keep on uh, seeing, but will not perceive. Uh, you'll look and try to, to uh, understand what you're seeing, but you'll be incapable of being able to do that. Now, I wear glasses. Many people do. If I take my glasses off and try to focus at a distance, I can't do so. Uh, and it, that's very frustrating. I know that there's something there. I, sometimes someone can enter a room. If I have my glasses off at the, at the far end of the room, I know that someone is there, but I do not know who it is. I cannot perceive them unless I put my glasses on. And even then, if they're far enough away, I still can't perceive who it is. And so it's something like that, but it's in the spiritual realm that uh, Isaiah was uh, told to preach to the people that they would continue to see and to see. They would see the, uh, the, uh, the truths that Isaiah lived out by illustration in his life, the things that were done, and yet they had no comprehension of what was going on. They could not perceive the realities of the things that were being put right before their very eyes. And he also says... Uh, uh, the heart of this people has become dull. Uh, so what's happened is rather than a quickening of the heart, which is what the Holy Spirit does, when the Holy Spirit comes to one who is dead in trespasses and sins, who is one of God's elect, when the Holy Spirit uh, enlightens the eyes and unstops the ears, He also causes that heart to begin to beat in rhythm with the gospel of Jesus Christ so that the heart which was dead and stony, as Ezekiel describes it, becomes alive. But as Isaiah goes to proclaim to these folks, uh, what happens is their heart becomes dull. And Paul is saying the same thing is happening to the leaders of the Jews, that rather than having their hearts quickened, made alive by the gospel of Jesus Christ, uh, as the gospel is proclaimed to them, their heart becomes dull. It becomes calloused over by constant rejection of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, and basically, uh, this is a, a guilty, uh, suicidal tendency on their part. They're dead in sin, and yet, as Paul says in Ephesians chapter 2, uh, we all were like that. We used to walk in deadness of sin, and so we were like uh, spiritual zombies. I hear these leaders of the Jews are very much like that too. They are dead in sin, but they are actively dead in their rebellion against God. Uh, they are rebelling against the truths that are there, and they're making their hearts even deader, they're making their uh, ears even deafer, and they're making their eyes even blinder by their rejection. And God basically says, if, if you would turn to me, I would heal all of that, but you will not. And so they have closed their eyes, uh, they have uh, uh, shut up their ears, and there is no understanding in their heart. God would grant that to them if they would repent, but they, uh, they will not. And God would heal them if they would turn, but they will not turn. Uh, they are in rebellion against Him. 
And so uh, what Isaiah was called to was this ministry uh, that no pastor, no minister of the gospel ever wants to be called to. And that is a ministry of faithfulness, but not fruitfulness. In other words, most of Isaiah's ministry uh, was a ministry that brought judgment and brought the curse of God upon those who heard him rather than the enlightening of the Holy Spirit and uh, faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so uh, Isaiah had been called to uh, faithfulness rather than fruitfulness. And in relationship to the Jewish people, Paul was called in the same way, to faithfulness, to preach the gospel to the Jews, but not necessarily fruitfulness from his own countrymen. He longed for that. He tells us in the book of Romans that he longed for that type of thing but that did not happen to him. Now, that doesn't mean that Paul was unfruitful at all. Certainly he had uh, great fruit among the Gentiles, which was what he was called to do. Jesus gave him that commission to be the apostle to the Gentiles, and he had great fruit among the Gentile peoples, but he did not have much fruit among his countrymen as well. And so uh, their rejection, Paul says, uh, at the end of uh, having quoted this section from Isaiah is, uh, once again, he says, now I'm turning to the Gentiles, and I want you to know that they will listen to the gospel. They will hear. And so uh, he's hoping to provoke, as he says elsewhere, he's hoping to provoke his own countrymen to jealousy when they see that the Gentiles are repenting of sin and trusting in Jesus and receiving the blessing of God. He's hoping to uh, provoke them to jealousy so that they also will repent and they will turn to the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, but that's not going to happen. Still, he's going to turn to the Gentiles, he says. They will hear the gospel, they will repent, and they will be saved. And then Luke concludes this entire uh, ministry by explaining in the last couple of verses of this chapter that for the next two years, two full years, the Apostle Paul uh, lives in Rome. He's in rented quarters, whether this was that cell where he met with these people or someplace else, we don't know. But for the next two years, he's there. And he is welcoming all who came to him. And so this is the close of the book of Acts. Uh, we might wish that, uh, the, uh, that Luke wrote more about Paul. We don't know from any of the New Testament scriptures uh, specifically and in an authoritative and infallible way what happened to Paul. Uh, we believe that he was crucified in Rome. Uh, possibly not here. And so uh, many folks believe that what happened was there was no ev evidence of Paul's wrongdoing that uh, at this first hearing before Caesar, he was acquitted, he was let go. Uh, he went on and ministered either elsewhere or uh, in the area around Rome. We're not really sure. He talked about wanting to go to Spain. Maybe he went there. We don't know what he did. But we uh, do believe that he was re-arrested, that he was then thrown into a prison cell and chained to guards in, in a much worse condition. He was uh, put on trial before Nero, and he was executed. And so uh, all of that Luke does not tell us. Luke has brought us to uh, the heart of the Roman Empire, to Rome itself. Uh, this is a fulfillment of the first chapter where Jesus had said that his uh, disciples uh, would be witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and to the uttermost parts of the earth. And so Rome represents the spread of the gospel to the uttermost parts of the earth. This is the center of the Roman Empire. It's the center of uh, enemy territory. And now the gospel has penetrated there. Now Paul has gone there. And that is Luke's mission in writing this book. And so he's brought us to this place. Uh, what does Paul do while he's there? He spends his time, it says, preaching the kingdom of God and teaching concerning the Lord Jesus Christ. And he does this to everyone who comes to him. Uh, we would assume that that would include fellow Christians. We would assume that it would include uh, inquiring Gentiles who might want to know something about Christ. We would assume it might include uh, Jews who also might want to know about Christ or Jews who wanted to argue with Paul and tell him how wrong he was. Whoever came, Paul welcomed them and he spoke of those two things, the kingdom of God and the lordship of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so he preached God's kingdom to them, that God is the sovereign Lord of all, that he is the king of kings, Lord of lords. He has created the universe. It is his kingdom. He rules over his kingdom. 
Uh, he has ordained all things whatsoever come to pass. He has elected a people for salvation from all nations on earth, and that from before even the beginning of time, uh, that he purchased that people with the precious blood of his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so Paul preached Christ. He preached Christ as the only Redeemer. He preached Christ as the Savior of sinners. He preached Christ as the Lord of glory. He preached Christ as the Messiah spoken of in the Old Testament and come in the New Testament. He preached Christ as the one who took our sins upon himself, went to the cross, and bore God's wrath and God's punishment due to us upon himself. And he bled and he died in our place and took our curse and bore our punishment so that he would then in turn impute to us Christians by faith. He would impute to us his holy and perfect righteousness so that you and I can stand before a holy God cleansed by the blood of Jesus and robed in his holy righteousness. And so he preached all of those things that Christ is now risen. He, uh, death could not hold him. He is life itself. He rose in victory on the third day. He has defeated sin and hell and the grave and death. And he is alive forevermore. He has ascended. He is seated at the right hand of the Father in heaven. He is ruling and reigning right now. And he shall come as the judge of the living and the dead at the last day. Paul proclaimed all of those things. And the church believes those things. And we proclaim those things. Also, uh, and the question for you, of course, is, do you believe those things? Are you a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ? Have your eyes been opened? Have your ears been unstopped? Does your heart beat in rhythm with the gospel? Uh, do not let your heart remain dull. Do not let your ears uh, remain deaf. Do not let your eyes remain clo uh, closed. Call out upon the Lord. Call upon Him to open your eyes and unstop your ears and give you a heart uh, to believe. And He will do so. Now, Paul's in chains. He's maybe in chain only to one uh, guard at a time, but he's in chains. And yet the gospel is not chained. He is hindered, but the gospel is not hindered. And so uh, Luke concludes this letter by saying that Paul did all of these things. He, he preached, he taught concerning the Lord Jesus Christ, concerning the kingdom of God, with all openness, unhindered. Now, uh, he was chained, but the gospel was not. Nothing can stop the gospel from going forth with the power of God because it is the Holy Spirit who takes the gospel message. God's minister, the Apostle Paul, may be in a prison cell, but the gospel he proclaimed was not imprisoned. And Paul is able to write later on, probably at his second imprisonment, that the gospel had penetrated even into Caesar's household itself. And so while he's in chains, the gospel is unchained. While he is hindered, the gospel is unhindered. And that means that you and I, Christians, must take heart as well. Because it seems that at this very moment, we are constrained, we are constricted in our movements, and yet we can take heart that the gospel is not constrained, it is not constricted, that it goes forth with power, and God, the Holy Spirit, will use the preaching of the gospel message to bring His elect to saving faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, and that cannot be stopped. Take heart, Christian. Rejoice. Rejoice always. Let's now conclude with prayer. Our gracious God and Heavenly Father, as we have finally reached the end of the uh, book of Acts, uh, we have come through a time of uh, turmoil for your servants, a time of persecution. Uh, we've seen uh, the Apostle Paul attacked, left for dead, shipwrecked, snake-bitten, uh, all sorts of things have happened to him. He's been stoned, uh, chased from town to town, and now he is in prison. And yet, Lord, uh, we rejoice that Luke uh, leaves us with the last word, that, uh, that of unhindered, that Paul was able to continue to pray and to proclaim. Lord, bless us to do exactly that. May we take this message that we have heard, and may we also, with unhindered prayer, and unhindered speech, proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ to all around us. 
Lord, we know that your word will not return void. It will accomplish what you send it out to accomplish. And so our prayer is that you would make that a reality, that as we tell others of Jesus Christ, as we proclaim the truths of the gospel, that that powerful message would go forth in our day unhindered and that it would accomplish all that you intend as the Holy Spirit takes it and uses it to awaken dead souls to living faith in Christ. So please bless all who uh, watch this message, who hear this message to repent of their sins and to trust in Jesus. I pray in his precious and holy name. Amen. Thank you so much for being with me as we've gone through the book of Acts. I look forward to bringing the word of God to you again the next Lord's Day as well.